Uh, thank you very much for attending our session on how Tableau uses our data to manage our workforce. Um, by raise of hands, how many people manage teams? Wow, so almost all the uh, room. How many times have you been asked to do more with the same, i.e. make your teams more efficient by raise of hands? About the same number of people, that's good. Um, so that's what I have happened to me every single year, is that right now we're in the process of doing 2019 planning and as a publicly traded company, they say, Tracy, we want to grow a revenue like this, but your head count can only grow like this. And so I need to figure out how I can do things more efficiently or effectively to produce that revenue without just simply throwing heads at it. Uh, my name is Tracy Fagan, and I've worked for Tableau for seven years. I manage the customer consulting organization. Uh, it has been in some other countries or uh, companies, it's called pre-sales. Uh, the reason that we renamed our team was that we do pre-sales work and we also do post-sales work now and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, as we get through, further through the presentation. Um, again, been with Tableau seven years. When I started, the customer consulting organization was 20. So seven years and then later, we're at 400. So uh, you can only imagine with the growth like that, you really need to focus your people and align them so you're getting the best use out of those resources and you have to be able to justify adding resources when the team gets this big. Hey, good morning everyone. Uh, Tracy's co-presenter, Matt McWhorter. Uh, I lead the customer consulting team for the southern US, so it's good to have the conference in my corner of the country. Um, I came to Tableau from Kronos, which is a workforce management uh, time and labor company, and it was at Kronos that I discovered Tableau when a friend of mine invited me to the 2010 Tableau conference. So that was the third annual conference, and there were about 700 people. It fit inside a single hotel. And I didn't know much about Tableau at the time. Uh, it was new to me. I would, had been doing business intelligence and data warehousing, but I was there to learn. So how many in the audience are here for the first time at the conference? Awesome. Wow, that's great. About 75% of the room, first time. Well, welcome everyone, and especially those first timers. That conference, little did I know, was going to change my life. I've been at Tableau now seven years. It's been an amazing journey. Uh, I've been in the sales consulting and customer consulting organization the whole time. So what you're going to get out of this session today are really some ideas. Tracy and our goal is to inspire you and give you some ways to use data to manage your most valuable resource, your people. We're going to go through a little bit of context so you understand what we're going to talk about, so tell you our story. Then we're going to get into how does a solution work. Uh, give you a little bit of the nuts and bolts so you understand the technology behind the scenes. Then we'll talk about the data that we collect and the decisions we drive off of that. What is the business impact of what we're doing? And then we'll open it up for Q&A. Feel free to interject with a question if you think of something uh, along the way. We're happy to take those as well. Uh, but we do have some time set aside at the end for the Q&A. So when this session's over, we're hoping that you do uh, walk away inspired and confident to be able to take some of these concepts and apply them to your business. Just by show of hands, how many in the room actually do what we do? technical pre-sales or sales engineering? Okay, we got a couple companies. Um, how many are in financial services? Okay, how about healthcare? Sales. Sales operations, generically speaking. Oh, great, there you go. okay. Yeah, we hit the horizontal on that one. <laughs> Good, so we'll talk a lot about, you know, how we manage uh, the opportunity, the revenue, um, and then behind the sale, the customer success. We'll, we'll get into that. So let me tell you a little bit about who we are, what we do at Tableau for context. Um, there was only three or four that were in technical sales. So just to give you a background on, on what we do, it's a very fun and rewarding job because we get to be involved in the customer's journey both before and after the sale. We're really the stewards of the technology. Customer consulting are the stewards of the technology. So it's really up to us to bridge the gap between what the product does technically and how it ultimately benefits our customers. So we work with our customers to understand their business problem, shape a solution, and then present it uh, in an easy to use or easy to understand way. Now, part of our challenge is we work with a number of different groups. So there's different interpretations on what the customer actually needs in the solution. So we have to take all those inputs, be it 
marketing, sales, engineering, and distill it down to ultimately what the customer wanted, in this case, the tire swing, um, and do it in, in an efficient manner. Um, we have fun with this process, and uh, what makes it challenging is, you know, you're gonna hear different things from different people. It's kind of like playing the game telephone as, that you did as a kid. It gets uh, interpreted in different ways. So it's up to us to really produce that most elegant solution, given that you know, marketing said it should look like this and sales said it should look like that and so on. So I'm gonna turn it now to Tracy. He's gonna talk a little bit more about our role and our mission. Great. So as, as Matt said, we've got a lot of different challenges. Uh, we work with a lot of different groups, uh, making sure that we're making the customer successful. Um, you know, the customer success uh, is not defined by us as a company. You know, if you work for a company that has sales, people would think success is revenue. In reality, it's customer's success is defined by their definition and what it takes for them to meet their objectives. So they realize their uh, accomplishment of those objectives. Um, the challenge we have, as Matt said, is that the gray circle is what represents customer consulting at Tableau. And we have to interact with different departments internally and externally, such as partners or service companies, to actually make the customer successful, but it's all around the customer itself. The other challenge is we have uh, customers that are multinational, and so the team we have today is 400 uh, across 20 different countries in the world. And so we really need to make sure that we're aligning these resources at the right time to actually produce the results that we're looking for to make that customer successful by their definition. So before we start talking about the data, you really need to define um, your objectives. How are you gonna measure success? And the one thing that I, I need to make sure everybody really takes away from this is, don't worry too much about the fact that the cheese moves every once in a while. Your objectives will change from year to year. There will be core objectives that stay the same, but there will be other ones that move, and you need to realize that you need to change the way you gather data or the types of data that you collect. With that said, um, in 2017, we were a uh, predominantly perpetual license company. And for a perpetual license company, you really focus on revenue. So the three objectives we had and their corresponding priorities were revenue generation, or opportunity support, demand generation, which is marketing, putting more leads in the funnel so we could do number one more. And then the third thing was customer success. In 2018, we flipped things because we became a subscription company. We're trying to get our predominant amount of our revenue through subscription revenue. And when you do that, the number one priority needs to be customer success. Hence the name change from pre-sales to customer consulting because we wanna make sure that we're supporting the customer to help them achieve their objectives or their goal. The second one is opportunity to support and then the third is lead generation. We're gonna talk about lead generation as an example of resource utilization. Um, with that, Matt. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, what are we capturing, right? So to, now that we have our objectives defined, it's time to start collecting the data, making sure that we have all the individual elements to do the analysis. And obviously without that, you can't manage uh, decisions, you can't manage change. So where it all started is we use salesforce.com internally for opportunity tracking, task management, and in this case it was an entry form within Salesforce, and you could tie it to an opportunity or tie it to an account record. Ultimately, this was a manual process that every consultant did on a weekly basis. They would enter their time, we'll talk about that in more detail. That ended up in a very complex schema behind the scenes within Salesforce that um, if you've worked at all with the Salesforce data model, you know it can be pretty tricky, but to, especially to get this data for analysis. So we had to tackle this problem. We actually use an internal uh, data warehouse. We call it Alpo, and after eating our own dog food. That's our data warehouse, and we migrate the data from Salesforce into Alpo, and that's where we can enrich the data, transform it, make it easy, uh, for analysis in this, these questions. Now, where did we evolve to? I showed you the form on the first slide with the Salesforce data entry screen. This is where we've evolved to. This is a, a Tableau dashboard within Tableau server that the consultants can come in and they'll see what are the most recent opportunities, what are the recent accounts, 
essentially it's anywhere, anyone they've already logged time to. They can do some searching, you know, find it by team, and then we're asking them to enter some very basic details. So you can see the company name, what kind of activity did we do, uh, how much time did we spend on it, and how much prep and travel time was associated with it. So it's pretty basic. Um, you know, on a given week, most of our consultants touch around six to eight different revenue opportunities, uh, and that, you know, total of 10 or so accounts. So they're entering about 16 to 18 records on a given week. So this streamlined the process. Um, what you'll see on the right there is actually a form. Anybody doing write back or using Tableau actually as a data entry mechanism? Okay, this is, got one hand up. This is uh, a really great capability that the extensions API enables as well. So if you're asking about, well, how did you make this happen? This particular plugin will write data back into Salesforce when you enter it. So very nice to be able to click and then quickly navigate. All right, so where did we end up? We got all that data inside our Alpo SQL Data Warehouse. If you were to look at the tables and how they lay out, that's across the top half of this slide. And there's quite a few that are involved in getting this kind of analysis. Um, but we didn't want to give the end users or make the end user do that first before asking any questions. We wanted to streamline it and we're using what's called a published data source. How many in the room are familiar with Tableau Data Server? Have you heard of Tableau Data Server or published data sources? Just a few. And that's not uncommon. That's a, a missed opportunity with many of our customers is Data Server, kind of a misnomer, it's included with Tableau Server, is really a mechanism to share data and provide a semantic layer on top of a more complex database. So in this case, you know, I can quickly see which fields are part of the account entity or the opportunity entity. I can see the measures there, uh, under there. But I didn't have to join all those tables before I started asking questions of the data, because we have a certified data source that's published up to Tableau Server. So take a look at Data Server when you get back to your offices if you're uh, not using it today. Um, it really saves a lot of time and it ensures accuracy. Everybody's now working off the same uh, set of numbers. So thanks, Matt. Um, by raising hands, how many people actually are using Salesforce? Probably 75% of the room. Um, if you don't have Salesforce, it doesn't mean you can't do this. I mean, a lot of other CRM applications will allow you to gather data. If you don't have one, Excel will work just fine. And I'm serious, people can use Excel, enter the data, and you can report off of it. The key thing is you need the data. So if you don't have the data, you can't report. Before we talk about some of that stuff, uh, it's about aligning to our objectives. Um, I did talk about the, the three objectives and the priority we have this year. But to actually achieve the, those objectives, we need to have four pillars that we look at. And it's, do I align the resources correctly? Um, are we focusing on the right areas? Um, in planning, how do I use this data? And then lastly, uh, you wouldn't think that it would be in this list of pillars, but it's the health of the team. So attrition in any company is you know, a horrible thing. You lose that experience, you have to ramp a new person. So we like to make sure that we have the health of the team as one of those pillars. So I'm gonna go through a whole bunch of examples. Uh, these are actually screenshots. Um, you'll see some of them, as Matt showed, that are blurred, because these are actual ones that we use on a daily or weekly basis. This one, uh, is affectionately known as Hogzilla, and it's who uses the, re the most resources losing the most revenue. Um, so uh, you, you don't want to be on the Hogzilla report, so we made it a positive side is who's using the most resources winning the most money. So in this example, you have an individual at the very bottom there, well, I should explain what they are, is each one of the marks is a salesperson. The color represents a different segment with inside of our uh, company. The size represents the number of opportunities that they're actually working. And then lastly, on the bottom is the number of hours on the x-axis, and the y-axis is actually the amount of revenue. So when you look at the bottom, the person on the far right there with the circle is doing pretty well. They're using a lot of resources, but they're generating a lot of revenue. So I don't really have a problem with that. If you look up at the very top, I've got an individual, I don't know if I can point to it, right, I guess I can click it, would be smarter. Um, I've got an individual, very small dot, so that means there's probably one opportunity, two opportunities, that they spent, you know, 
about 55, 60 hours losing those opportunities. I don't really have a problem with that either. They obviously can identify opportunities and pursue them, and ironically, it's the same person. So what I can come away with looking at this is that this person is really good at A, identifying large opportunities, and B, qualifying them correctly and getting out correctly at the right time. When I look at this person, this person spent 350 hours losing a lot of revenue. That's a problem with me. Because if I could take all the time spent in that quarter and move it down to the bottom left, that would give me the resources to actually push those people higher up from a revenue perspective. When I look at this person, how do they do when it comes to revenue that they've won? It turns out they use a lot of resources there too. So there's got to be an issue whether it is somebody on the customer consulting team not helping them qualify the deal correctly or they're just indiscriminate on how they use those resources. The thing to take away from this is any of the time that I can take from the right-hand side of this screen and move it to the left-hand side of the screen and down, I've got additional head counts without actually physically adding them. The next area is focus. You saw the three uh, objectives that we have, customer success, uh, opportunity support, and then marketing or slash event support. When I did this heat mat, it was for a reason I'd been asked to do additional support of an event. And I thought, you know, that seems a little odd. I, I think I'm over my threshold, but I want to make sure that I'm actually in aligning with the things that we're working on. If you look at the three squares of uh, success, opportunity, and marketing, we look like those are really the main areas we're focusing on. I do have two other blocks out there that I need to dig into a little bit. I mean, why are we spending so much time on personal development? We'll talk about that a little bit. And why are we spending so much travel time? Well, when we're doing marketing events, or a regular events, like this TC is an event, uh, I have about 200 people, almost half my team from a global perspective, here supporting this event. So that, that part of that travel would actually go towards marketing support. So I'm actually feeling pretty comfortable of how we're doing this, and are we meeting our objectives? The concern is, I need to go back for next year and pre probably break down the personal development and the travel so I can track it towards those actual objectives, opposed to have to make that assumption. So that's one of the to-dos we're going to do for next year. So on marketing, I got a phone call and said, um, hey, Tracy, we need 10 people to go and support this AWS event. And it was like two weeks' notice. And I'm like, really? So I, I don't know if I have that many people. And I was just kind of curious on how much the marketing organization was actually contributing to that event. So what I did was, is I actually added up all the hours that I did marketing events, customer conference, and actual marketing roadshows. And it came up, and I still have two more months left this year, I've got 14,000 hours supporting marketing events coming out of the customer consulting organization. If you use 1,800 hours as the normal calculation for a full-time employee, that turns out to my team was knocked down by eight. So I had eight people technically supporting marketing events doing nothing but that. I had budgeted roughly five for this year, and now I find out it's October and the cupboard is empty. In fact, the cupboard's spilling out. So um, the takeaway from this is that I need to either do one of two things. Go up to Adam Slipsky and say, Adam, I need more people. That's something I'm going to do. Career limiting. So I need to figure out how I can actually allocate resources differently in these marketing events. How can we do stuff that could be remote versus causing travel time? Things of that nature. This was a literally uh, one that I did two weeks ago, I think it, the time was. The next one is, this is around the health of the team. Um, we call this the windshield dashboard. Uh, I got a call um, from our finance group and said, Tracy, why does Kevin have $700 a month on personal car mileage? I said, I don't know. It's a car payment. Maybe. Who knows? Um, so I started digging into the data a little bit. So I had the data of where he was spending his time. I had data coming out of Concur that we pulled in so that I could actually see the expense amounts. And it turns out that Kevin lives in Lapeer, Michigan. 
but Kevin supports some of our largest customers in southern Michigan. So every single week, you'll see the uh, weeks uh, right here, you'll notice that Kevin's traveling every single week, putting lots of mileage on his car. I don't really care about the mileage. I care about the fact that he's away from his home, sitting behind a windshield every single week, driving down to southern Michigan. So my takeaway from this is uh, twofold. The first one was Kevin's health. So I want to make sure that Kevin doesn't have to drive down there. So in 2019, it makes logical sense that I would add another headcount supporting southern Michigan. Not only do I just add one headcount, but I get half of Kevin's time back to support, so it's almost one and a half true full-time FTEs. The other thing that is not the health of the uh, uh, individual is that I could reduce the cost of this as well by having Kevin rent a car to do those trips. So that's the actual short term that we have right now is Kevin just rents a car and saves a tremendous amount of money and doesn't put the wear and tear on his car as well. Um, so not only do we have things that we're measuring um, those pillars, but also we have internal measurements. Uh, the internal measurements are things like customer success, and you'll see what I mean by that from an internal perspective. The second thing is around operational excellence. And the third thing is, and I forgot it off the top of my head, I always do that. Uh, data entry. Uh, no, operational excellence, um, customer success, and I will get to it in just a second. <laughs> that happens when you get gray hair. So here's our, our group of things that we're actually uh, looking at. Um, we've got things around um, time entry, so that's operational excellence. We've got things around customer success, that's uh, around our ex uh, first objective. And then the last thing was um, around, um, escapes me again still, we'll get to it. So first thing, customer success. Uh, we put a goal out there that we want our team to be spending 70% of our time engaging customers or facing customers. So that would be something around here participating in this, doing emails, answering questions, on site, doing a Tableau day. Anything we can do to be in front of the customer. If you look at this, I'm not meeting my 70% goal right now. I'm not too concerned about that at this point because for the last three, four weeks, we've been actually preparing for this event, creating these presentations, doing training, practice dry runs and stuff like that. I'll see that after this conference, we'll actually probably be above that 70% threshold. But when you look at this, you've got two individuals that are drastically below not only their team average, but the 70% that we have out there. Doesn't mean it's wrong, it just means you need to take it to the next level. Is are they spending their time doing personal development because they're new? This is just the first question. There's a lot of other questions that are driven based on this. The next thing is, um, <clears throat> when I create a plan, I need to kind of figure out, okay, how much time am I, I'm, am I going to be spending doing these types of activities? So for a certain group of 2,000 customers, we said on average we're gonna spend roughly six hours a year with these customers, directly engaging them outside of sales cycles and things like that. So, for the most part, I'm doing all right, but if you look at that top bar, I've got one account that's burning through a lot of resources. So in some cases, that's appropriate because you've got an issue there that you've got to solve. They might have some technical support issues that a customer consultant might need to be on site to do things. So I look at the data below. The data below, each one of those squares represents a type of activity. It's hard to read the types of activity, but they're up at the top. The, uh, the gray, or the, I'm sorry, the tan ones on that top bar, those are actually server discussions or server deployments. And the yellow ones are actually ad hoc requests. So with all the questions around server deployment or server configuration, I might be encroaching on our professional services organization. There might be an opportunity to use different resources out of another team to fulfill those needs, opposed to me doing so much of that. The gold ones are a big problem for me, because those are ad hoc requests. 
If I'm trying to make a customer successful, I can't do it ad hoc. It's got to be a given plan. It's got to be a success plan that I'm adhering to. If I'm doing th everything ad hoc, it's ad hoc. It's not prescriptive. So it's not proactive. This is another round of the employee health. Uh, we do time tracking. Mike, or Matt had showed you how we do it. Um, I don't require them to enter 40 hours every week. You know, it's a suggested time that they enter 30 hours a week. Uh, the goal here is not to make sure that Tracy is coming to work and putting in his 40 hours before he gets home. What this is used for is somebody overworked. Does somebody have too much on their plate? If you look at the third line down, the individual has got one yellow, everything's green except for a bunch of weeks where it's solid red. That means they're working over that threshold. So I've got two things going on. Person is either bad at time management and has to work long hours to get their work done, which I doubt. Chances are, though, what it really is that they have too many accounts or reps that they're supporting, both in a pre-sales cycle and a post-sales cycle. The concern I have, that's burnout. I'm going to have that individual leave, and I've got a big hole in the organization. On the other side of it, if you go two lines further down, I've got an individual that's got half yellow and half green. So that's a good life. I'm not working as hard as my other people in the team. The challenge I have is that that person's bored. That person isn't constantly challenged. And I have the same problem. I'll have attrition because that person is not engaged. If I can take hours from the third person and put it to the fifth person, I've actually worked, leveled out that workload. And I've got the problem of overworking and burnout. And I've got the problem of burn, uh, boredom solved. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, investing in the employee uh, around personal development. Uh, we have two groups within customer consulting. Uh, we have product consultants, which I typically hire out of college, so it's their first job. And I have this experienced pre-sales organization, which are sales consultants that have five to ten plus years doing the acumen of technical pre-sales. But I want to invest in the PCs most because they're coming out of college, I need to train them soft skills and things like that. So we have standard training programs that we put them through, but we also give them 120 hours a year to do personal development. If they want to use to learn Python or Java or whatever, they can actually take a course and we use Pluralsight to do that and we track that. And then for the sales consultants, which are the seasoned one, we give them 60 hours if they want to learn new technology so that we're investing in them and they feel like we understand the value they bring. Um, when you look at this, you've got a couple little challenges. I've got the, the goal here of 50 hours, I'm sorry, and then I've got people, a team average of 60 and a team average of 39. Um, the first initial thing you were going like, looks like a couple of people just do personal development. That could be an issue. You've got another couple of people that don't do any of it. So this is, I need to take it to the next step is are the people that are spending so much time doing personal development over what we budgeted brand new? Maybe we hired them outside of our industry. They have no pre-sales uh, acumen in the sales consulting organization, which this is Matt's team. So they came from, let's say, a customer or another industry, and we're teaching them that acumen because we wanted their business experience. We wanted that life experience to bring to the team. So this is just an example of I think we're all right, but we got one more step to take it down. Operational excellence. Um, how many of you have people that are required to enter time? About 10. OK, so it's a requirement at Tableau. There's a carrot out there. By showing people how we use this data, it's not did Tracy enter his time. It's are we focusing the resources again we're at the right places? Are we taking care of you from a personal perspective? In this case, um, what I have found is that if we don't enter time within a 14-day period, the accuracy of that data goes drastically down. If you go and look at what you did a month ago, the only place you can go is to your calendar and say, was I on site that day? How long did I, what was I doing? So it, it just, the data drastically goes down. So we put a performance uh, vital few factor in here that they have to have it within 14 days. Now, 
Not everybody's going to be that great about it. We track it. These types of visits are used for discussions with individuals about how important this data is. I can't make sure that I get enough headcount to support the needs of the organization if I don't have this data, which means you might have a lot of red bars next year because I didn't get the approval. So the data is really important to have that. Uh, for the most part, we do pretty well. We have some individuals that are just not going to be there. You can't beat them over the head with it. Um, we do have one carrot in this one, for sure, is that in our sales consulting organization, they actually qualify to go to President's Club. And the way that we do that is based on the amount of revenue that they generated stack ranked against each other, only counting the time that was entered within 14 days. So if they work on an opportunity and they don't enter their time in 14 days and it closes for a million dollars, that just went into the trash can. So they're pretty motivated to get this done. The next thing is uh, technical close plans. Uh, a technical close plan is something that we've put in place. Um, you can think of it as a project in your organization. Is These are th milestones that we need to accomplish to get to the end goal, to reduce the risk of not making it to the end. The technical close plan has seven different elements that we track in an opportunity. So these can be milestones within a normal project. Um, there are things like, are we the right technical fit? Um, did the customer buy off on the solution that we presented against their business issue? Um, did they, are we in alignment with our sales team? It's really critical that we're not positioning something that they're trying to sell something different. Um, there are these factors, again, are just used to reduce risk. The green bars mean that I've actually completed my technical close plans within the period of time that I have agreed to on my vital factor. Uh, we also have the vital uh, within, I'm sorry, the technical close plan is part of our big deal dashboard. It's a KPI on our big deals when we're looking at forecast at the end of the quarter, it's a red, yellow, green dot on whether we actually have that plan in progress, it's closed, or it hasn't even started. In this case, they've either started or they're in progress. If I had red bars, I would have a concern. That, mean, that means that I've got a deal that's above $250,000 and I don't know anything from a technical perspective of do we have the basis covered. So this is one of those indicators that my project is off track if you look at an opportunity as a project with milestones. All right, so we've got our vital factors and those are the things that the leadership team looks at to make sure we've got good quality data and people are being invested in personally and that we're balanced across the team. When it comes to running the business, the individuals and the managers of those teams need a way to track day to day, week to week, and quarter to quarter. So this is a summary, I'll show you a few examples here of how many of these opportunities, aka projects, do we have that we're working, what, are, what is their value and revenue, how many have been won, how many are open, and then how many of those technical close plans, again that little miniature project plan, are still open and need to be completed. So someone could come in here, a team, usually perspective, and look at what's happening this quarter and next quarter, uh, what are the individual opportunities, and then we've got them sorted by the revenue value. And then they could see who's working it, who's the salesperson, what, what customer is it for, um, how much time have we spent on it. So all of this data comes together from both our opportunity management and sales force in this task tracking that we're doing for customer consulting. Another perspective is kind of where do I stand relative to my targets or my quota, and then how does it break down across the team? So I'll zoom in on the different parts of this dashboard. Top half is what's the distribution by individual? So it could be how on the blue bar it's the number of opportunities, on the orange bar it's the amount of revenue. What's the percent for a given individual? And this could be done by sales consultant, it could be done by sales rep, it could be done by team. The point is, by individual, we want to make sure that the team is balanced, right? We don't have too much revenue uh, being worked by one person or that person doesn't burn out uh, given the number of opportunities they have to, to lead. On the right there, that's really the, our sales process, our sales methodology. What are the stages that these projects or these opportunities go through before they close? We spend a majority of our time in that validate phase in the middle. So I would expect it to look this way when we took this screenshot, but as the quarter progresses, 
those num opportunities are going to migrate down into the lower stages. But this gives us both the revenue and the number of opportunities in each step. And then if I wanted to see, okay, how many of our opportunities are invalidate by individual, I can select the bar and see that uh, percent, percent uh, distribution. Now, if you get into the lower half, these are the nitty gritty details that we can see for a given opportunity. What's it worth? When's it gonna close? How many months has it been in the process? When was the last time we touched it? Right? We would expect that on a weekly basis, maybe every other week, we're checking in with that customer, checking in on their evaluation, seeing how things are going. So that's a good risk indicator is how many days has it been since we have a task for that opportunity. And then how much overall time, right? We have one that's 28 months in the cycle, 203 hours. The good news is this last column is our technical risk. So have we closed out the technical close plan? And if we have, it's marked lowest. So that tells me that we're almost done with the work and it's probably some, something to do with commercial terms or negotiations or maybe the customer's just not quite ready yet. But that's something that I could flag to my sales leadership as a potential risk opportunity. Then we've got ones that, hey, we need a technical close plan on these, but it just hasn't been done yet. So we've asked the team to, hey, over certain thresholds, let's make sure that we put this thing to manage risk on top of the opportunity, that technical close plan. Now, when you hover over one of those technical close plans, you'll get the details behind it. So Tracy mentioned some of those steps, like did we identify the technical lead? Have we documented requirements and so on? And then we've just got some free form fields to tell us what do we need to do next? What's remaining? What's the sentiment of the customer? How are we doing overall? Lastly, at the bottom there, one of the great things about you know, using Salesforce and using it with Tableau is just the inner linking between whether it be a dashboard that links to Salesforce or inside Salesforce, a Tableau dashboard that's embedded, we've got a link to the opportunity, right? So we can click on go to salesforce.com, that'll then open up the opportunity record. And it could be a task, it could be the account. If I see an error in my dashboard, the data's bad, I can go fix that right away because now I've got a link into the source system. Lastly, the pre-sales activity. So for a given opportunity, we would be able to go and say, well, what's the timeline? What kinds of events or activities have we been doing? And are we checking all the boxes, right? On a typical sales cycle, we know we want to do these five things. <clears throat> have we been able to do that with the customer? And who's spending the most time on it at what stage in the sales cycle? And then that gray line is the day that we anticipate it will close. So we kind of know what we're doing leading up to that point. So this is a great way if you want to investigate an individual opportunity and uh, how that time's progressed. Now, one last example is kind of a, think of it as a one pager, right? We use our email subscriptions quite a bit because we're often in the field or on site with customers. We're not in front of our laptop. This gives us in our email just a snapshot. Where are we on the quarter? How's our business distributed across our enterprise customers, our commercial customers, our different districts? And what of those technical close plans, how many are outstanding? So this is more of a summary for a manager to look at. Down below here, it gives us the amount of opportunities that we're even touching, right? There's a, about half of the opportunities in the organization are happening without our involvement because the customer is simply expanding or there's no, no technical proof that needs to be done. But we do like to know of those opportunities, um, how many are we involved on? So that's another uh, health factor. And the beauty is, you know, we have teams that kind of roll their own to some extent. That's why you saw a few different examples there. Standardization to a point, but at least everybody's using the same data set. And for the most part, the nomenclature is the same, right? Everybody can look at one dashboard for their team and understand what it means. So we talked about the vital factors, the things leadership looks at. Now we've talked about some things we use to run our business on a quarter to quarter basis. What I'm gonna hit next is kind of that third use case of what are the things that we don't know, okay? What are those things that maybe Tracy spots something he wants to dig into and he can go in and investigate or in this case he's gonna ask me to go look at um, how much time are we spending on accounts after the sale, right? So remember our objectives, and number one was customer success. Well, we classify that time as post-sales activity, post-sale activity. So I'm gonna switch over now. We'll do a little live demonstration of answering that question. 
okay? And the concern that Tracy had is, hey, we have these accounts that are growing or you know, put them in our top customer segment. They're over a certain threshold in revenue, and we want to make sure that we're investing in them beyond the sale, doing things like doctor hours, Tableau days, technical webinars. So I've got my Tableau desktop here, and for sake of the Wi-Fi, I went ahead and took the two data sources. So remember I talked about the certified data source, and that includes all our customer consulting hours. That's at the top there, customer consulting. You're seeing that here, the different dimensions and measures. This is time to complete. So this is in hours, 720,000 hours. It's got about two years worth of data in it. I want to see how it's broken down. Just flip this around. We'll look at the activity type and do a quick sort. Let me uh, increase the font for you just a little. And we'll fix this. So now you get a sense for, you know, most of our time is spent working on a given opportunity or account. We've got an other bucket for some of our um, activities that don't fall into opportunity support or others. We've got um, professional development that we talked about tracking, and then we've got our internal activities. The one that we're most interested in is this post-sale support. And being that we just transitioned to the subscription model in the last 12 to 18 months, that's the one that we just started tracking. So you're not going to see as many hours uh, in that bucket yet. So let's go ahead and focus on that. The other thing is I want to make sure that these are hours that we allocate at the account level. So we've got this three different options here. I guess there's four now. <laughs> account, opportunity, an internal activity, or a marketing activity. So I'm focused on where we're investing in just the account. In other words, we didn't do this uh, at the um, individual uh, opportunity level. We did it at the account level. And then we can drill and look at, OK, what are the detailed tasks? You saw a few of these on those other screens, but the one that we spend the most time on is working on support cases on behalf of our customers, right? Just kind of doing some hand-holding, making sure that communication is flowing, and maybe translate some of the things we're hearing from the customer to our support team. Um, and then followed by Tableau days. And this, again, is aggregate hours. The Tableau day is where our customers uh, want to host an internal event to get excitement and build adoption. And then we partner with them to do that, and we would present maybe a roadmap, what's new and the latest release of the product, give them some inspiration on how they can use Tableau. So those are good things. We want to be doing this type of activity with our accounts. Getting back to the question that Tracy asked me, he wanted to know, for the accounts that are growing, are we doing these activities? I want to ensure that we're doing it equal and fairly across those largest accounts. So this first data set is just my hours and opportunities. Now I'm going to go to what we call our sales opportunity data source that includes what are all the different opportunities that we've worked as a company, not just as a customer consulting team, but as a company. So this is um, you know, both closed one and lost revenue. I do want to bring out kind of an aggregate to show it by date. So we've got our closed date in here, and I just bring that out. Tableau is automatically going to roll it up to the year, which is what I'd like to see. So you can see from 2003 forward, kind of how revenue has grown year to year to year. But ultimately, I want to look at a running total. 2018 isn't complete yet, and that's why it dips down. I want to be able to show what is the progression in these accounts, and we'll get to the account now. This is an aggregate total. I'll bring the account ID in, and show me says, OK, I think I know what, what to do with that. I'm going to put that on detail. So now we, we'll be able to see each account's growth trajectory. Let me just fit the uh, width here. Um, so now you'll kind of see that pattern in accounts. And some of them you know, took off like a rocket ship. Others, they slowly matured over time. But what we want to focus on is any account that is life to date spent a million dollars. Let's just term those our growth accounts for purpose of answering Tracy's question. So I will put our filter out. I've got a parameter that does that. Um, and I'll put our filter out so that we just grab those accounts over a million. Now, ultimately, what I want to do is take uh, these unique identifiers for the account and then apply them to that 
post sales data set or post sales hours and look at uh, for these accounts that are growing, are we investing in those activities? So to do that, we're going to use Tableau sets. Have you used sets in Tableau and are you familiar with the concept of a set? Okay, it's kind of like a list of items. Uh, if you were programming, it would be like an array, but essentially it's all these unique account IDs. We're going to take them and apply it now to our post sales hours data set. And if I just click on the header here, I hover over one of the dots and I get this little three ring or two ring um, item there. Now this is going to put them in a set. If I lasso them, there's a couple different ways to create a set, but if I lasso them, it now gives me this summary view. And if I do create set, this will throw in any of the fields that are in the context of the visualization. So notice how a year of close date is there. If I had selected multiple years, it would pick those and put those into the set. But to make a unique set of items, all I need to do is close the columns that I don't want. So if you think about it, you know, if you have selected something that includes different dimensionality, but all you want are the unique customers and the counts in that selection, you can close those columns out and it's just going to collapse it down in the set. So you see what we've got here, 483 customers over a million in lifetime spend. Now I would create that set and I call it growth accounts over here. Okay, it takes about 30 seconds, so just a little cooking cheat there on my demo. But growth accounts is our set that we can now put in our other data set. So I want to take this and copy it. Now why does this work? The set is based on the account ID. And the account ID is the unique identifier that we're going to use. And now that we've got the set in our uh, post sales data set, let's go back here. I'm going to duplicate this sheet. And on this one, uh, we're going to just flip it around. And here's our growth account set. I want to change the mark type first. Because now what we'll do is kind of an A-B analysis, right? Show me the hours that we're spending in those growth accounts and show me the hours that we're spending outside the growth accounts. So I'm going to drop that on color. Let's just uh, give it a little size. Now, I would go to Tracy and say, okay, Tracy, I know how many hours are being spent in our growth accounts. How does this look? Not good. Why not? It looks like we've got a lot of blue, higher than orange, so we're spending a lot of time in our non-growth accounts. So the set is working here, and for those of you in the back of the room, you can't see the anything orange is considered a growth account, anything blue is outside that set, not a growth account. So we can see aggregate hours for support cases, we spend a lot more time on those accounts. Now remember, we've got 78,000 customers, and 483 of those are considered growth. So that would make sense that if you just add up the hours, you're going to see that. But what I'd like to do is just normalize it so that we're really looking at it on an average per account basis. So I'm just going to do uh, time to complete. You know, we can type a formula in here, much like you would do in Excel. And then I'll do a count of our accounts. So I'll do a unique count of account ID. And as I think of new calculations, now what we're seeing on the bottom is a normalized view of average hours per account. Very simply, I type that in. And if I wanted to make that a reusable calculation, I just drag it over into measures and give it a name. All right. So, Tracy, what do you think about this view? Is Much this better. Answering the question? Much better. Better? Again, that goes to back. Are we focusing the right resources? The question came up. It was not my question, it was management's question. We switched to a subscription model, we created a customer success team. Are we deploying the resources correctly? Matt, I delegated, obviously. <laughs> Matt, to answer this question. So this was a, a live question that was asked to me. So I'll just take that top view out since the hours didn't make sense aggregated. And now we can see that you know, our most successful customers, the ones that have grown over time, are doing these type of activities. Again, I mentioned the Tableau day. That one is the top if you look at average hours per account. The screen's a little blurry, but you would see office hours down below as the second highest, and then followed by technical webinar. So we can look at the behaviors of accounts that are most successful, and we know at a minimum they do those three activities, and this kind of gives us a gauge on whether or not they're going through with that. 
and we're helping with it. So now what I want to make sure is, are any accounts that are in that growth set slipping through the cracks? In other words, we haven't done any type of post-sales work with them. I want to make sure we identify them and approach them with a plan, or maybe there's a reason we haven't helped them. So I'm going to go back to this view, and I'll just pull in our individual account ID because, again, I want to go the opposite direction now. So remember, first we started with the growth accounts that came from our sales opportunity data set. Now we're going to go from our post-sales hours data set and go back to the sales data set with the account ID. So each little tick mark there represents an account. And if I just select the, the uh, header there and I click on our ring here, I can create a set. Now remember I was saying, well, we could collapse columns out that don't apply. Notice how there's 3,783 records in this set because of the unique, unique combination of those three fields. If I take out each of those, notice now it went down to 2,206 different accounts that we've done post sales activity for. Now I would then name this set and save it right here in the data set. So now we've got um, accounts with post sales activity. And just like we did before, we're now going to copy this set and put it back in the sales opportunity. All right, so now that's the 2,206 accounts that we've done this kind of work for. We can go back to our original view where we identified which accounts were in that segment and apply this to color, just like we did in the AB analysis, and it's going to show us the accounts that are in the set and out of the set. All right, so the out are kind of hidden behind the in there. I'll just resort those. And you can see I've highlighted there is one account that is growing at a pretty good rate, uh, about middle of the pack in terms of those top revenue accounts, but we haven't done any post sales activity for them, right? So I would want to go investigate why is that? You know, are they doing a lot of that on their own internally? Do they have a partner involved that's helping them drive adoption? Um, and that's a conversation we could have with our team. One of the things we noticed, though, is that uh, if I just keep those that are outside the set, look at their trajectory. You know, many of them have invested, but it tends to level out, especially relative to those other accounts. So that might be an indicator that you know, doing the Tableau days, doing the webinars and the doctor hours really is causal in terms of helping uh, drive success and drive adoption. So that we can now see the growth curve of each one of those accounts. So pretty interesting. Now I can take this back to our team. Ultimately, I want to present this to Tracy. So I'll put it, it together in a, a dashboard view with both our post sales hours by activity type and then our growth accounts. And you know, being based on live data, I could publish this up to Tableau server. We'd be able to monitor this on an ongoing basis. But Tracy, how does this look for uh, solutions? Let's get to your question. Yeah, that looks great. Um, this goes to um, the first visualization I showed you where I had all those hours that were wasted and losing revenue. If I could actually refocus those to these customers down here, can I turn them into growth customers? They're still large customers, they're just not growing like the other customers. So again, if I don't have resources, I can't reallocate them. But in this case, if I pull them from that lost, you know, the Hogzilla report, I refocus them on there, I might be able to push those customers up. So that's the whole idea here is, is identifying hours or resources that I can save and refocusing them to actually be more efficient. All right, so we talked about a lot of things. We covered both our story, uh, how we capture the data, and then ultimately the decisions that we drive off the data. And we showed you some of those ad hoc requests that come up, questions how we go and drive uh, results out of that. Um, any questions that, that come up or have you thought of through the presentation that you'd want to okay. raise? Go ahead. I'm going to do that. Questions? Got one over here? Sure. 
Uh, so the question was, what's the cadence? How do we review this data with our teams to make sure that we're pretty much all on the same page? So what's the cadence? Um, we have one-on-ones with our team, uh, individuals, and we have weekly meetings with them. We also have sales forecasts with our teams that we use this data, and those are typically weekly. Um, they actually get to the point where they're daily when it gets closer to the end of the quarter. But this is something that's actually used. I use it almost every single day, and I have conversations with my direct reports, because a lot of times everybody knows it rolls downhill, and somebody will ask a question, and I need to make sure I have the answer. So um, reviewing this with like Matt and with Brad and other people that report to me is literally a daily thing in some cases. Other question? Uh, so if I'm understanding the context of the question is, how do I make sure I don't have conflict between the customer consulting organization, the sales organization that uh, is uh, in conflict about whether an opportunity is going to close or not? So we make sure that the culture is not to say the sales rep has their own complete attitude and we have ours. That's where the importance of that technical close plan came in. It's a non-biased opinion. It's the sales consultant's uh, a judgment on where we sit on a technical execution of the plan. The sales rep has their own opinion, but it, it, the point where we say, are, are the sales reps and the technical people, customer consultants aligned? There is a box for that, and they know that the value of having that technical close plan filled out actually drives revenue. Their win rate's a lot higher. So it was something we introduced slowly, and it was accepted over time, but if, uh, one organization, when I showed this, they immediately created a dashboard that says, here's customer consulting's forecast, and here's sales forecast. Didn't go over very well. So I would, I would make sure you caution you, do not do that. You want to keep the teams together. One of the things along those lines we've done is be able to look at, you know, where have we closed out the plan, but it's not in this quarter, it's in next quarter. Because essentially the work is done, and that might be a way we, we could pull that into this current quarter. Again, there's other factors at play, but we flag those opportunities because we've already essentially done all the technical proving to get the opportunity in. Got a question here? So we do a lot of self-reports from our reps to see whether we still have certain areas of poor performance. Um, aside from using that to better it, or to kind of not work that behavior, are there any like pitfalls or red flags that you need your customers to be aware of? Okay, so the question was, if I can summarize it, is um, the accuracy of the data, there might be different ways to, to enter data. Um, is there discrepancies in the data? Have we found those discrepancies? Yeah, or is there any like red flags, like how bad this is, not the result of Causation versus actual effect. Um, so the, the, I mean, you can actually look at deals that we've touched that customer consulting has entered uh, time to has a higher probability of closing, simply because you've got two, two sets of eyes and ears working it, um, is one thing. Um, as far as issues within the data, I always name uh, problems with data by the people that cause them. So I have rules. So the, the Franz rule is, uh, Franz entered like 4,000 hours in a given week, and he was entering minutes instead of hours. So you have to look for those discrepancies because they really will skew it. Another one is that if they're not working on an account or working on an opportunity, they post it to what's called catch-all. So like personal time off, um, it, it could be a holiday or, or whatever that is not directly related and um, that'll skew it because that gets all entered as a, a mutual interest. And so the problem there is if I look at mutual interest time, I don't want to spend a lot of time in mutual interest in our sales cycle. Mutual interest is like a blind date. Two people agree that there's common attraction. Let's go to Starbucks and have a cup of coffee. I don't need a technical person with a sales rep to determine that. So I need to take you know, the 25% of the time that I spend in mutual interest to move that down. So there's things like that um, that are what I would call discrepancies in the data of what I would expect to see.
correct. Is that duplicating that and that extension in Tableau? Oh. The data entry section, is that duplicate data entry? Yeah. So the question is that we're having our reps, I want to make sure that it's the customer consulting organization, not the sales reps that are in time. Uh, well, I, maybe back, yeah, yeah. you mentioned duplicate, the, oh, the sales reps are doing that side of the money. Well, so it, the way that it works is that um, the, we have the customer consultants that report into the customer consulting organization. They enter time on the activities they work, whether it's at the account level or at the opportunity level. The rep enters their own activities at the account level or at the opportunity level, but it's not time-based. It could be an email that they sent or something like that. We gather time based on the opportunities as customer consulting is working we enter time that's associated with those opportunities using a task. The, the, the extension that Matt was showing you is simply an extension in a dashboard that allows us to enter time there that writes back to Salesforce on the opportunity that they selected. So otherwise what they do is they get into Salesforce, they would search for the opportunity, bring up the opportunity, hit add task, and then the task would come up and they'd enter the information which slowed it really to the point where they had a valid reason not to enter time every 14 days because it took too long. And it was inefficient. Other questions? Well, so thank you very much for coming. Um, if you could please fill out uh, the survey. Uh, we use this information to make these presentations better, uh, to add new ones and get rid of the ones that people you know, don't find of value. Uh, the other thing that I'll leave you with is that this was just added. Um, before and it's not on the schedule. And this is actually how we do uh, account-based marketing uh, in conjunction with LinkedIn. And so this session's tomorrow at 1045. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much.